Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Sergey Gavrilis. I'm a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology and also mathematics here at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I'm also uh, associated with two uh, centers here, the Center for the Dynamics of Social Complexity and the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis. And these are two centers that uh, organize uh, uh, these uh, series of webinars. And I have here uh, these two web pages that I uh, encourage you to take a look at, uh, Nimbus and DISOC. And Nimbus has been around for like more. And DISOC is much more recent. Uh, and we have a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, we also had uh, a number of different activities related to the topics of, of this uh, webinar on cultural and social evolution and there are, you can uh, watch and papers that you can read, so please uh, do it. Uh, and also this whole series is uh, one of the outputs of uh, a grant from John Templeton Foundation to pr promote research on cultural evolution and also promote cultural evolution society. So kind of one of the things in which are at the core of this are teaching modules that were uh, developed. Uh, by uh, several teams and uh, Paul Smaldina, today's speaker, uh, is one of them. So uh, here we have a schedule. Uh, there are five uh, lectures uh, by uh, uh, tutorial uh, lead designers. There are also two lectures. One uh, took place last week by Pete Richardson uh, by, uh, and now one will be at the end by Patricia uh, Izar. And these are people who were the members of the international committee who had organized competition. And then we're also going to have two uh, invited lectures by Peter Torshin and Ruth Mays, who run very successful research programs, but were also uh, founding editors of two very important journal dynamics and evolutionary human uh, sciences. Uh, so, and uh, before I introduce our speaker, Paul, I'll ask uh, Eric Carr, who is our data engineer, to tell you a few words about how it works, uh, the logistics of the webinar. And Eric? Uh, welcome to the webinar today. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A &A feature for all attendees. Uh, you can submit your questions there. You can upvote them. You can comment on them. And at the end of the talk, Sergey will be uh, moderating and asking those questions. Um, if I will be monitoring chat if you have any issues, but please do put your questions in the Q&A. Have a great talk. Okay. Yeah, and we also uh, may have several of uh, uh, Eric, what's the status of panelists and these are speakers uh, of uh, this series or people who were closely involved into the development of, of this program and we will have a chance to ask and directly and uh, lead some discussions and now it's uh, my uh, great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce Paul Smaldino who is a paradigmatically promiscuous scientist. And that's how he calls himself, and that's from uh, his uh, web page. And if you look at his CV and what he's been doing in his life, you will definitely agree with that. He grew up in Long Island, New York, got his uh, first degree in physics, and then he had this he spent uh, hanging around and doing very different and exciting things. He was a lab technician, audio engineer, movie production assistant, lead guitarist, high school math tutor, textbook copy editor, and psychiatric nurse aide. <laughs> and then he decided to go back to school and got his degree in psychology. Remember, the first one was in physics. And then PhD in psychobiology. And when he did a couple of postdocs uh, with very uh, well-known and famous people, and again, it was uh, a Center for Advanced Modeling, it was Department of Anthropology, Department of Political Science, Department of Computer Science, uh, the whole package. And since 2016, uh, Paul's been at the University of UC Merced, uh, where he was just recently promoted to Associate Professor. Uh, in the departments of cognitive and information sciences. So it's very really great to have, you have, to have you here, Paul. Take it over. Hey, thanks, Sergey, And uh, thanks everyone for coming. All right, let me see if I can. Oh, okay. 
And let's try this now. Okay, are you seeing my main slide? Yes, we are. All right, great. Um, okay, so I'm, I wanna talk uh, a little bit about uh, teaching modeling and, and that, what I think of how that relates to a pedagogy of cultural evolution, uh, which is I think very directly relevant to the theories of modules and tutorials that uh, were so graciously um, and excellently funded by the Templeton Foundation and supported by Pete and Sergey and Nimbus and Dysok. So thanks uh, for having me and I'm really glad I could be part of it. Um, so the backdrop here is, I think social science is more important than ever. There are a lot of problems that we are facing in our times and they are social problems, they are human problems. Right? So we need to know things like, how does information spread and misinformation? How do beliefs and opinions change? Um, uh, what facilitates or impedes people working together toward common goals? How do norms emerge and change? And then I, I think this is, this is the best way I could think of to phrase this, is now like then and will it be again? So what are the kinds of trajectories that happen and that occur in social dynamics, right? Are they, do things go toward equilibrium or are, are they, they cyclical? Um, the issue for studying these kinds of questions is that the social sciences are deeply siloed, right? So researchers studying human behavior are siloed into many distinct disciplines, different methods, different theoretical frameworks, different perspectives. And I totally recognize that there are institutional benefits uh, for breaking things up into different departments. But doing so also has problems, right? It limits the sorts of questions that researchers tend to ask and the approaches that they use to answer those questions. It also means that researchers often lack frameworks or tools for dealing with complex problems at multiple scales that, involves, that involve sort of issues that multiple silos uh, study from different angles. So it would be helpful to have a bridging framework, a uh, bridging framework to facilitate communication between researchers and to foment uh, better research questions. Now, given the title of this whole series and who funded it, it's probably not a total shock that I'm gonna propose that cultural evolution is potentially a unifying framework for understanding human behavior and social change. I think there are a few good reasons for why this is the case. One is that it's inherently interdisciplinary. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec, right? The field of cultural evolution has developed as inherently intrinsically cultural evolution drawing from biology, anthropology, psychology, mathematics, all the social sciences and the human sciences and the biological sciences. And it has sort of done so independently uh, to a large extent of uh, the, the sort of historical traditions of the, the individual silos. Um, another thing is that by doing so, it incorporates multiple scales. So uh, both organizational, so from the level of individual decision makers to the level of societies, as well as temporal. So from the millisecond level of an individual decision to the millennia time scale of how societies change uh, over time. It's also rooted in formal theory, and I want to say a lot about that uh, later. So what's cool about cultural evolution is that you can study cultural evolution and draw from all these disciplines. So it works really well for me, who I'm always terrible at picking one thing and sticking to it. I like to flit around a lot. Um, and it's one of the things that I find really attractive about uh, studying cultural evolution is that there are times when I can I'll say, oh, there's, there's this work from anthropology, there's this work from sociology, economics, psychology, linguistics, philosophy, evolutionary ecology, epidemiology. All of these fields have important contributions to make to the study of cultural evolution. But also, you can work more solidly in one of these disciplines and still benefit from cultural evolution. Um, cultural evolutionary thinking uh, it provides a set of core concepts, I think, about human behavior that uh, I think can facilitate interaction between the disciplines. So it can sort of serve as a conduit between conversations in the different disciplines. Um, of course, cultural evolution isn't the only sort of amalgamate discipline. There are many others, sort of 
the field of complex systems, network science, cognitive science, which is my home department, and communication science. Um, and I think all these things, you know, the, these disciplines as well can draw uh, from multiple sort of more traditional disciplines and also inform cultural evolution. I'll still argue that cultural evolution has a sort of advantage over the others because its approach is rooted uh, with the goal of understanding humans in their proper context, which is culture. Um, I want to talk about the approach to studying uh, cultural evolution and related, which is uh, that I'm going to talk about and that the tutorial I did uh, is really about, which is formal theory. Um, and I, I recently stumbled across this really great paper by the philosopher Jim Griesemer called Formalization and the Meaning of Theory in the Inexact Biological Sciences. Um, so Griesemer draws this distinction between exact sciences which, uh, in which theories involve a direct mapping between measurable constructs and model predictions. So for example, if you're a physicist and you have a model about, let's say, charge or force or acceleration, velocity, mass, right? These are things that are measurable very precisely. And the theories are about predictions of those measurement, measurable quantities. The inexact sciences are those where that's not the case, right? Where mapping between measures and theories are imprecise. And this creates a challenge for theory in the inexact sciences and often a widespread preference for empirical models. So heuristic models, verbal models, rather than formal models, models sort of by example, by archetype, by prototype. Um, now, the social sciences are inexact. Um, and so we have to grapple with that and we have to accept that, that the theories that we're gonna produce are often gonna be qualitative more than quantitative. And that we have to focus a lot and think really hard about what we're measuring and what we're talking about and what the relationship is between what we can measure, what we wanna measure and what our theories sort of predict or talk about uh, are. Um, the thing is that social systems are gonna be modeled whether we like it or not. And I think we want to make sure that the people modeling them are social scientists, uh, if not by training, then at least by inclination. Um, and what I mean by that is, if you're working on social science, then you're a social scientist. And you should be beholden to the standards of a social scientist and know what the relevant literature is, etc. Right? I, I've definitely heard too many people say, well, I'm not really a social scientist, I'm not really a biologist. And, uh, I'm just working on this project. But I, I'd say if you're working on the project and the, stud, the, the subject of study is behavior, then you're a behavioral scientist, right? Um, I think we also want to avoid the problem uh, that this XKCD that many of you will know illustrates, right? This sort of problem of physicists and computer scientists modeling systems uh, that they don't necessarily understand and making a lot of sort of problematic assumptions. Now, I love physicists. I once sort of was a physicist and a lot of really terrific models and methods have come from physics and computer science so i am not putting down those fields at all um but i think it's inherently challenging to have interdisciplinary work where you have fields that are traditionally um very quantitative but don't have deep training in certain things like social behavior or psychology and then you have those fields that do have deep training in those things, but don't have the methodological approach, right? So it's one of the, the important challenges for interdisciplinarity. I'd say even, even though we have this issue of the inexact sciences, formal models still get you a lot. Um, one is a clear articulation of what is and isn't included in theory. So for example, when I did a Google image search for formal models, these three images are some of the first that came up because I forgot that most of the world doesn't use the word model in the way that I do. And so what I meant was something like a mathematical uh, articulation of a complex system and not very good looking men in fancy dress. Um, so I needed to be more clear in my articulation to Google. Um, I think the formal analysis of assumptions uh, it really lets you probe the consequences that arise from them, right? We want to know what are we assuming and what are we not and what necessarily follows from those uh, assumptions. 
And you still get qualitative predictions very often, even if they're not quantitative. And here's the thing, what the formal model gives you that is much more difficult with a verbal model is clear scope. Now scope is something that I was introduced to by, uh, from sociology. Um, and some of the other sciences, social sciences, behavioral sciences haven't thought as much about, although recently psychologists have started talking about constraints on generality, which is related, uh, but not quite the same thing. So scope is, is basically just uh, the need to articulate what are the constraints on when a theory holds or doesn't, when does it apply, when doesn't it, what kinds of conclusions can we draw on under certain assumptions and not others. And being clear about this is something that's much uh, more easy to deal with when you have a formal model. Um, formal models also gives you mental models for understanding the dynamics of relevant complex adaptive systems. So really the only way we make sense of anything in the world is by analogy to other things. And if you go into a restaurant, right, you know that, well, I mean, well remember when we could all go into restaurants, right? Some of you have still. Um, you can go in, there's usually like a host that says, oh, how many are you? Okay, it'll just be a second. And then you follow them to a table and they hand you a menu and you look at it and you understand that you're gonna sit down. You have the, there are things that you can look at. You can order food off of it. The waiter's gonna bring you food, it's gonna bring you water. These are the things that you're gonna do. Um, what you're not gonna do is go in the corner and urinate. You're not gonna lay on the floor and take a nap. You're not gonna bust out into song at the top of your lungs because these are, that's not the kind of place you're in. That's not the kind of situation you're in. Um, you have a mental model for what happens and doesn't happen in a restaurant and what kinds of things could happen and what kinds of things are unlikely to happen. And when we're talking about understanding complex social dynamics, we need to understand the kinds of things that tend to happen when social structures are organized in particular ways. And most people are really terrible at this just sort of intuitively. And by studying formal models, we get uh, sort of an arsenal of mental models that really uh, can help us grapple with these. Finally, sort of going back to uh, sort of a bridging concept, it, models can give us a common language for talking about complex adaptive social systems. Um, what are models? Why should we use them? Um, lots of researchers use models. Uh, most of you, if you're scientists, use models at some point. Um, models can be physical, models can be not physical, models can be abstract. Um, basically, if you're, if, how do we know if you're using a model? You ask yourself this question, am I studying directly the thing that I'm interested in? Is everything about my question covered in the thing that I'm studying? Or am I drawing inferences from the thing that I'm studying to the bigger question? And if the second is the case, then you're using some kind of model. All right, so I, I take this definition from the philosopher Michael Weisberg. Um, this is a picture of a scale model of the San Francisco Bay. It's uh, in Sausalito. You can still go look at it. Um, and it was used by engineers in the 1950s and 60s to make decisions about whether or not to uh, dam part of the bay, which is a very complicated question, but it would be very costly to just try it. So they built a model to sort of see what kinds of things would probably happen. Um, Lots of scientists, behavioral and biomedical scientists use animal models, sort of drawing inferences from what happens when they study the model or what's going on in the biology or the behavior or the cognition of some animal to other animals, including humans. Experiments are models, right? Unless you're, you know, working for the marshmallow industry, most people don't really care how long a child can wait to eat a marshmallow. But you're interested in things like trust, willpower, um, patience, uh, relationships to authority. And we develop paradigms that capture certain aspects of those things and we draw inferences from them. So the, the experiment is a model for the larger class of behaviors that we're interested in. And I think that these are all, it, it's much more of a continuity than a clear delineation between these other kinds of models and formal models through mathematical or computational models. But they are kind of special formal models. So a formal model is the simplified version of a system with a specification of parts and relationships between them. Um, I really like this, this phrase. It comes from the biologist Jeremy Gunnawardena. A model is a logical engine for turning assumptions into conclusions. 
Right? And this is useful, right, because our, our intuitions about complex systems are often really bad. And so models can show us how assumptions lead to unexpected conclusions. Um, how do we build a model, right? If, let's say we want to understand the behavior of some system, right? We got to break it down. We have to first articulate that system in the model. And I think this is really the step that often gets glossed over that a lot of people who aren't uh, doing a lot of modeling don't understand. And I, it's a point that I really want to emphasize because this is sort of the key. The, the, the programming and the mathematics are challenging, but once you have training that they're pretty mechanical. The real issue and the, the, what makes modeling complicated is how to articulate a system in a way that answers the question. So you have to do what I, I, I think of as decomposition, to borrow a phrase from Herb Simon. Um, so what are the parts of the system? What are the properties of those parts? What are the relationships between the parts? And how do those properties and relationships change? The parts might be individual people, they might be firms, they might be tribes, they might be cells, right? We might be interested in, in you know, focusing on things like health indicators, age, sex, wealth, et cetera. But we have to think clearly about what properties we need to build into the model as part of our explanation and what we're going to ignore. How you decompose a system depends on the questions you're trying to answer. Like, there's no single right way. And this is often really frustrating to a lot of people. Say, well, how do I model some system? Well, it depends what you're interested in. There's lots of ways to model a system. There's lots of ways to think about something. And the way you break down that system into parts isn't obvious because a full decomposition, right, would be everything. It would be just the entire world and you'd have to go down to the atomic level or the level of quarks or strings or whatever and include every single thing in the world, right? A model inherently and all explanation inherently leaves certain things out. And the real question is, what are you going to leave out and what are you going to keep in? So there's no one right way to do it for any system or any that you're interested in studying. It's uh, the best decompositions and therefore the best models are those that capture essential elements for understanding some aspects about the system that answer the questions we're most interested in. That said, some canonical decompositions that sort of everyone knows and learns can be really helpful and they can help drive theory forward by getting lots of uh, people working on similar problems and they can encourage communication and collaboration so that we know that what we're talking about when we talk to each other and we can know that we're talking about the same thing. So I think we need formal models for a complete theory of human behavior. Um, but there are some issues, right? Um, one is that most social science students, the ones most interested in the social kind, the kinds of social problems that I talked about at the beginning, uh, often receive little to no training in modeling. So there are some exceptions. Uh, economics has a pretty well-established uh, history of training in modeling and cognitive science sort of more recently has traditions of training in models, but there, there are some really important limitations to those modeling traditions. So models and economics are rarely dynamic. They're usually um, about computing equilibria. Models in cognitive science are usually about individual decision-making and cognitive processes, rarely population level. Uh, and they're almost entirely uh, computational. Uh, sometimes you see training in game theory or agent-based modeling, which are great, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. Uh, one issue I would say is that oftentimes this training is pretty atheoretical. It's sort of, here's a tool that you can use to build your theory without really talking a lot about what people uh, previously have learned and how it relates to the kinds of questions that we're interested in. Now, social science isn't the whole of science that's interested in social behavior. Um, there are lots of existing modeling pedagogies, and some of them are really useful, but in general, they're not designed with a cultural evolutionary framework in mind. So mostly, uh, they come from either biology or complexity science. So think of the Santa Fe Institute. Um, I, these are both really great traditions, and I have learned a, a ton from them. 
Um, the biological systems are, are really great and I really encourage social scientists to engage with the literature, the modeling literature from biology, particularly evolutionary ecology, um, at least in terms of the questions I'm interested in. Um, but they're rarely geared toward cultural and social systems at the level of complexity uh, that human cultures are uh, made of. And then often uh, models from complexity science are focused on sort of emergence, um, sort of a, a wow factor, look what we can get when we have a lot of interacting parts and are often a little bit weak on theoretical motivations. Now, these are, I'm painting all this with a very broad brush and there are exceptions and there's really exceptional work uh, from all of these areas uh, that, that don't have these constraints, but I'm sort of using a, uh, I'm focusing a little bit more on the uh, stereotypical view. So how do we do it? Um, how do we develop a, a modeling tradition that gets at the issues that we're interested in from a cultural evolutionary framework? Well, cultural evolution itself has a really rich tradition of modeling. Um, starting in the, the late 70s, early 80s, right, with, with people like Cavalli, Sforza, and Feldman, Boyd and Richardson, and they built up these models really based on models from population genetics. And so evolutionary modeling plays a really strong role in modeling in general and understanding cultural evolutionary processes. So maybe everyone just needs to learn evolutionary modeling, but not so fast. So here's, uh, uh, here's Pete. He said he might not be able to join this week, uh, but he's here in spirit. Um, this is a, a quote uh, from his talk last week. Evolution is not the synthetic principle. It is a synthetic principle. Um, so we need to go beyond just evolutionary modeling to understand social processes. Right? Integrating the social sciences requires what I think of as a, a new kind of pedagogy in modeling. Now, the fact that evolution is not the synthetic principle is going to come to no surprise uh, it's no surprise to social scientists, economists, sociologists, and the like. But I, I still do think it's worth emphasizing this because uh, a lot of cultural evolutionists, uh, among whom I count myself, sometimes forget this with uh, the kind of training that they get. So I, I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how this kind of pedagogy, I think of this kind of pedagogy and how it might emerge. Um, so there's this gap that we need to bridge and I think that the long run goal, at least for me, is in developing a core modeling pedagogy for understanding human social behavior. Um, so there's the challenge. And one is that human behavior is so varied and idiosyncratic. It's just too varied and idiosyncratic to distill a core. Humans do all kinds of things, uh, both individually and in groups. How could any one curriculum capture those essential aspects? And to some extent, that's a completely valid criticism, right? There's no one curriculum that's going to capture every aspect of human social behavior or every modeling tradition that's important to the kinds of questions we want, might want to ask. But I do think it's possible to focus on certain universal and central features of human existence to at least develop, like I said, a common language of core models and modeling frameworks that both give us um, understanding of these are the kinds of things that are really important and so we all know how to talk about them in similar ways and also it gives us shared modeling traditions so that we can take them in different directions um, collaboratively. Another challenge is uh, that's I think more serious to this is a lack of deep mathematical training and, and computational training among social scientists and, it's, and also humanities scholars. Now this is changing um, Computational social science is, as a sort of pseudo discipline is on the rise. Um, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of uh, headway has already been made in terms of better training for social scientists in math and computing. Um, I do think there's some limitations there in the way it's been, I think if we need to remember that formal theory is important, that explanation and not just data crunching are important. And so sometimes I worry a little bit about computational social science being overly focused on things like managing large data structures and machine learning and the like. And those things are all great, but uh, formal theory as well uh, is important for understanding and how, learning how to make sense of those data and to figure out what the, the, the important questions to ask are. Um, but I still think there's a long way to go between the situation now and the, kinds, uh, the kind of mathematical and computa uh, computational training that we need among social scientists to really develop rich theories that are, are not just 
relegated to fringes of the social sciences, but are, are, are much more core. So in the short run, we'll focus on simple models that require minimal formal training so that people can understand the kinds of, like the way that models work, the way that models decompose social systems into parts and relationships and the kinds of insights that one can get from those models. And I'll focus on things like agent-based models, which require some programming, but often not a ton and don't require necessarily uh, a lot of deep mathematical training. So a lot of social scientists have minimal experience with things like dynamical systems, differential equations, linear algebra, which are really important for deep work in these areas. But as a sort of scaffold, computational models, agent-based models, simpler models, um, sort of help get you there and sort of understand the benefit. And so with that in mind, uh, I developed um, this tutorial, uh, Models of Social Dynamics, an introductory module, uh, which is up on the DISOC website, um, among all the other CES modules. Um, and its aim was really to provide students with exposure to models, with the theoretical, theoretical intuitions you get from models, with tools to read and uh, understand models, and with pointers to learn more on their own. And, uh, a really key um, driving philosophy behind this was to assume minimal math and programming training um, and sort of assume training uh, consistent with usual social science uh, grad program entry requirements. Now, obviously, anyone can take this. You don't have to be a grad student or an academic at all. It's available to everything. All the modules have um, come with code. They come with their, their lectures, there are um, notes, and there are exercises for future directions. Um, I'll say a brief note. So if, um, if you're going to do computational modeling, you have to program on a computer. Uh, there's no getting around that. You have to learn a little bit of programming. I think everyone doing any kind of science should know a little bit of programming at this point. Um, there are a lot of possible ways I could have gone with those, um, but I decided to use NetLogo, uh, which is, I think has a lot of advantages for an introductory course. So NetLogo is free, it's open source, it's very widely used. Um, it has lots of really great built-in features. It, it got drag and drop features. It's easy to um, make visualizations and graphing and put in sliders for you know, real-time parameter value changes. Uh, it was explicitly designed to be easy to learn. So it was built to be learnable by, you know, a smart and motivated high school student. And so the writing looks kind of like pseudocode and it's pretty easy to get going. Um, I've taught modeling. I do a lot of my modeling in Java and I've tried to teach um, Java to undergraduates and it is just the worst. Um, you spend way too much time figuring out, helping people learn how to code and not enough time uh, learning how the models work. And that's really what I wanted to focus on here. Now, NetLogo has some cons. It can be a little bit slow for complex models. Uh, the built-in features can be overly constraining if you're trying to do something pretty novel. And so some people don't like that re reduced control. And so if you're gonna go deep uh, with modeling, you may want to learn a more complete language and use something like Java or Python or Julia. Um, but NetLogo is a really great um, thing to play around with. I recommend everyone uh, download NetLogo. Do it. Do it after this talk if you don't already have it and play with it. It's so fun and it has a model, a library of tons of sample models. Uh, a lot of them have really cool visualizations. It's pretty fun. Um, okay, so the course. Uh, the course is divided into seven lectures. Uh, each unit has video. It's got, uh, I've got, include the slides, notes, any code that I use, and exercises for independent study. So the first is an introduction. It introduces modeling more generally, and as well as a little bit of NetLogo. And the last lecture reviews the course and discusses directions for further study. Each of the other five units uh, focuses on one or two models for what I think uh, are key issues in uh, the human social sciences. So I just wanna walk through each one briefly, give a little bit of a preview of the course, and also talk about some of my own motivation for focusing on these topics. 
So we start with contagion. So obviously, this is a really important and salient topic for understanding the times that we're living through right now. Um, it's also a really good framework for understanding not just how diseases spread, but also how ideas, behaviors, and innovations spread. And people have understood this for a really long time. Um, so I mentioned before, you know, the, the history of modeling and cultural evolution really came out of population genetics. But in what I think of as like the first seminal work in modeling cultural evolution, which is Cavalli, Swartz, and Feldman's uh, 1981 book, they say in around page 40, um, they note, well, while they focus on pop gen models, another biological model may offer a more satisfactory interpretation of the diffusion of innovations than those derived from pop gen. That model is that of an epidemic. Uh, contagion models are really cool. They help us to understand how ideas, behaviors, and innovations spread as well as disease. Um, and also, these dynamics, and I think this is especially important right now at the current moment we're in, these dynamics can be coupled um, because socially learned behaviors also affect disease infection. Um, so I'll give a brief plug. Um, I've generally avoided plugging my own work in this paper, but in this talk, but uh, very recently I did this paper with Jamie Holland Jones at Stanford on coupled dynamics of busy, uh, behavior and disease uh, among antagonistic groups. And we get things that look an awful lot like uh, the dynamics we're seeing right now in certain parts of the world. Um, so in the course, it's a very brief introduction to contagion. So we study SI and SIS models. So that's susceptible, infected, and then with and without recovery uh, with mobile agents and consider how things like the time course of adoption uh, dep um, is dependent on the way that that thing is socially transmitted. Um, after this, I move from contagion to opinions and polarization. So this is probably the least uh, theoretically cohesive area in terms of the richness of its theories and traditions, but I think it's a really important topic to address. And there's a lot of work here for sort of model savvy social scientists. So I thought it was important because I think it's an emerging area of research. So polarization is a defining issue of our time. So many of you have seen figures like this. This is just um, the, uh, the degree to which people in the US identifying as either Democrat or Republican are consistently sort of take the liberal position or the conservative position on policy issues. And even 25 years ago, there was a lot of mixing, right? You couldn't necessarily tell everything about a person uh, in terms of their policy positions just by knowing they're a Republican or a Democrat. And now it's much more informative as those as issues has become much more uh, tied to particular policy identi identities and the parties have become much more polarized. So models help us uh, and really force us to consider how individuals communicate and internalize those opinions and beliefs, as well as how the structure of social interactions shapes opinion change and polarization. So if we're interested in things like how opinions change, how polarization arises and what we can do about it, modeling these kinds of systems is really valuable. And prior work suggests that the assumptions we make about these details matter a lot. So I, 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 I won't show it, but a recent paper uh, that I did with my grad student, Matt Turner, really examines the, just the kinds of assumptions that one might make in such a model and looks at how even various assumptions about let's say communication noise or network structure really changes the way opinions change. Um, I also think this is a really cool area of study because it really blends social science like sociology and network science with individual science like cognitive science and psychology. Um, so in the unit, right, we'll study some simple models of opinions with both po positive and negative influence. So um, positive meaning your opinions become more similar to others who are similar to you and negative influence meaning your opinions become more different from people who are different from you. We'll consider how the way that people are influenced by similar and different opinions shapes the emergence of distinct cultural communities, uh, as well as uh, the, the influence of simple network structures on uh, social dynamics. Okay, the next unit is on cooperation, which is a pretty core topic in understanding social behavior. Uh, I think almost everyone in the audience knows that cooperation is a pretty key topic. I think that there are really good reasons why everything we do 
and everything that we are as humans is by virtue of our ability to cooperate with each other. Um, I think the best example of this is, and I, I think this is the last quote I have in the talk, but there's this, I think there's so many, so much that has been written on cooperation, but still I think my favorite thing is this passage at the beginning of Sarah Hurdy's book, Mothers and Others. Um, this is sort of an abridged quote. Uh, Each year, 1.6 billion passengers fly to destinations around the world. Patiently, we line up to be checked, and patted down by someone we've never seen before. We file on board an aluminum cylinder and cram our bodies into narrow seats. Elbow. I think so. Having some video issues apparently right at this very dramatic moment. I don't know why. Keep trying. <laughs> Keep trying. Uh, we file aboard an aluminum cylinder and cram out bo our bodies into narrow seats, elbow to elbow, accommodating one another for as long as the flight takes. I cannot help from wondering what would happen if my, uh, my fellow passengers suddenly morphed into another species of ape. What would happen if I were traveling with a plane load of chimpanzees? Any one of us would be lucky to disembark with all 10 fingers and toes still attached, with the baby still breathing and unmaimed. Bloody earlobes and other appendages would litter the aisles. So cooperation uh, provides, is providing mutual benefit uh, at a personal cost. And this is the bedrock of human behavior. So understanding the conditions for how cooperation arises and stabilizes and also fails is an essential task uh, for a science of human behavior. Hopefully people can hear me. This seems to be an issue. Um, yes, Paul, we, you're cutting out a little bit, but you're coming through. Okay, cool. All right, um, so modeling also provides an opportunity to consider how behaviors and patterns of interaction co-evolve. Um, so in the unit on cooperation, we'll study cooperation and reciprocity using frameworks of prisoner's dilemma, the prisoner's dilemma game and evolutionary game theory. And we'll consider how things like assortment among behavioral types influences the evolution of cooperative strategies, as well as why a savvy reciprocating strategy, so tit for tat for those who know, can evolve where naive uh, cooperators cannot. Um, in the next unit, we'll talk about co coordination and norms. Uh, so this is hugely important. And it's honestly, I think because I, I didn't originally come from the social sciences when I uh, did my undergrad, I, I take a, a position that this is non-obvious. It certainly wasn't obvious to me how important norms were when I was sort of just starting out getting interested in human behavior. Um, but I've really come to appreciate the point, which is well known among social sciences, scientists, that norms and not rational calculations of optimal outcomes guide much of our behavior in social settings. So norms are often arbitrary, um, but they're, they're also just, they're not just useless. They're really important. They're what allow communities to coordinate and therefore uh, cooperate more effectively. So some norms are obviously better than others. Um, but it was really annoying. Um, and I'll just keep going. Some norms are obviously better than others, but a that includes current norms uh, may resist. So we might want to ask how norms change in these kinds of settings. Um, and a related question is how do diverse populations signal their norms to potential partners? This is a really, this is a question that I'm extremely interested in just more generally. And I think it's very re uh, much related to these kinds of models and these kinds of ideas. So in the unit, we'll study the evolution of norms using the framework of a coordination game. Uh, consider how group beneficial norms can spread or fail to spread when they're rare and how interactions between groups uh, that are largely separate uh, can facilitate the spread of group beneficial norms. All right, the final unit is on cycles. And I, I felt it for me, it was really, really important to include this as a unit um, because many social phenomena that we're interested in don't settle to an equilibrium but are cyclical. Um, so understanding the dynamics uh, of causally coupled quantities is really important for understanding social processes. So there's lots and lots and lots of examples. Uh, they range from predator-prey dynamics 
uh, to the dynamics of political instability and the rise and fall of empires. So this is a, a figure that, that many is probably well known to many of you, particularly any ecologists in the audience, right? This is data from Hudson's Bay Company from the mid 1800s to the early 1900s of populations in Canada of uh, snowshoe hare and lynx. And you see two things. One is that the populations of each of these species is cyclical, right? oscillates between many individuals and few individuals year to year, and also that they're coupled together. And models uh, like the Laca Volterra model have helped us understand uh, how these kinds of dynamics emerge. Um, also, more recently, people like Peter Turchin have pointed out that a lot of political dynamics are cyclical. So these are this is uh, cycles of, of violence um, in the last couple hundred years uh, in the U.S. So in the unit, right, I wanted to study cyclical dynamics, and I, I the first part of the unit focuses on an extremely simple model, which is the ecological host parasite model that generates very complicated and non-intuitive dynamics. I think it's one of the coolest models um, because of how interesting the behavior is from something so simple. And then we'll use that as a springboard to a much more complex model, which is Peter Turchin's meta-ethnic frontier model of how empires rise and fall. And consider how something that spreads rapidly when it's rare but becomes weakened by its own growth, provides the foundation for all kinds of cyclical dynamics. And in the unit, we'll consider how factors that limit growth can benefit an organism or society in the long run. All right, um, I'm cutting toward the end. Where do we go from here? Um, the overarching goal, at least for me, is to create better integration among the social sciences, the human sciences, the sciences that study human beings, at least partially. Uh, what is not the goal is getting rid of separate disciplines. Right? I, I think that disciplines are useful uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, in not only organizational, but there are, I think, tangible benefits from having sort of separate epistemic communities. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of both experimental and modeling work that has shown this to be the case. Uh, but we also need communication between these disciplines. Um, all the models suggest that some communication is, is optimal. And I, I will argue again that cultural evolution provides a framework for talking to each other. Um, in addition to that, I think we need a, a set of core models uh, from which to develop theories of human behavior. And I'm definitely not saying that the models that I proposed or talked about or focus on in the, the module are the models. But I do think that centering this core around universal features of human existence, so things like cooperation, coordination, communication, seems like a reasonable approach. So moving forward more narrowly, I think the first thing that you could do is go through all of the modules on the cultural evolution website uh, that myself and others and uh, others uh, who are talking in this series have put together. Right? There's a lot of really great stuff in, in these um, and you can learn a lot about cultural evolution and about modeling as well. Um, I the, the, the course that I've done is seven lectures. It's very abridged. Um, at UC Merced, I do a full semester 30 lecture course um, called Modeling Social Behavior. Uh, I am working on translating that course into a book, so hopefully that'll be coming soonish and I will keep people posted on that. Um, all right, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Paul. That was, that was a great talk. Um, so as we transition now into questions and answers, uh, Sergey is having some issues, so I will be taking uh, on the role as moderator. Um, and, and looking at the, the questions and answers, um, the one that has risen to the top, of course, is, Paul, do you have any related material in R? Uh, <laughs> something you didn't mention in, in your talk. And I'll also use that question as a segue to, to ask, People were talking about Python and how easy NetLogo is, but there was also a question about what math um, social scientists uh, need to learn. So if they have to learn programming and math and everything else, how do you fit that sort of into the curriculum for social scientists? Man, that's, these are all really good questions. Um, I'll tackle the easy ones first, which are I think the questions about programming languages. Um, 
I don't have any related materials in R, uh, except maybe a, 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 a smattering of scattered things that I've taken from other people. Um, Adrian Bell, uh, who I, I think is talking in this series, has, uh, I think all his materials are in R on his course. Um, there are lots of, of uh, sort of simple models of cultural evolution. I believe also last I checked, Alex Masudi has uh, a resource of simple agent-based models of cultural evolution in R. Um, there are a lot of things available for that. Um, Python, you know, it's, uh, I, I, Python is awesome. Um, I really like it. Um, and it's more and more being used for agent-based modeling. Um, I don't have any particular resources that I, I use enough to recommend. Um, but the sort of long, long-term goal after I sort of finish the, the, the book in NetLogo is to sort of redo all the models in Python um, because I think that that's probably the most, uh, the, the modeling framework that, that's most flexible. Um, as for the, the larger question of what math and, and computational skills that social scientists need to learn and how do you put this into an already busy curriculum? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations about that. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily that hard, um, but it does take, uh, I guess, being a stickler. Um, you know, in I think you can you can get away with offering sort of one or two courses that intro grad students have to take in modeling and just require them to have the requisite mathematical background to deal with it or to learn it. Um, the best way to learn a, a mathematical or computational skill is to have a project or a problem that needs to be solved using it. Um, I think that, you know, requiring students to have some mathematical background is not crazy. Now, there's this issue that comes up all the time, which is that not everyone can be great at everything. And if you require everyone to have all the skills, then you lose out on the people that are really kind of amazing and prodigious at certain things, but bad at other things. So you don't want to get rid of the person who's like an amazing ethnographer just because that person doesn't necessarily, is not good at programming. Um, and I think that's right. Um, so figuring out how to, how to deal with this in terms of sort of prerequisites, my, my inclination is to be pretty flexible. That said, I think that making theory core as part of disciplinary training and making that an understanding that knowing theory is, is really valuable helps us, you know, sort of show that there, there can be specializations and you don't necessarily individually have to be great at everything, but you have to know what the specialization is. You have to know what a model is and how it works so that you can see its value and you can work with modelers if you're not a modeler yourself. Um, it's, I think there's a lot of possible ways and I don't think I necessarily have the right way or the one way to, to do a, a pedagogy of modeling, certainly not at this point. Okay, so let's open up a question or comment from the panelists. Does any of the panelists wanna jump in? Andrea, you're still unmuted. Andy, you're on mute. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, yeah, great talk. Um, as you know, next week I'm going to be talking about animal culture, um, animal cultures, and um, you mentioned a bit about animal culture. Um, and I think several of the elements you've talked about would be, you know, would be relevant in, in animal culture studies. I mean, contagion, cooperation, norms to an, excerpt, to an extent, maybe even cycles. Um, on contagion, I was wondering, it, it's become uh, more common to deal with the problem we often have of, you know, establishing, is this social learning? Is this cultural transmission going on, uh, particularly in, in wild animals, uh, where you can't necessarily do experiments like with whales? Um, that Will Hoppet's methods of uh, network-based diffusion analysis has, has started to become quite useful and used in different contexts. For example, with chimpanzees, um, with whales, you, you perhaps know some of that work. Um, 
So there the social network is established and what you're really trying to see is does the contagion spread over the social network, which is what you'd expect, what you'd predict if social learning's happening. I wasn't sure if, if that's become a, of use in, in human studies. I mean, I know it mainly from the, the animal cultures world. Is that familiar to you? Yeah. Would it be relevant in that unit? <clears throat> uh, yeah. Um, so I, I, the impression I get is a lot of the, the social network stuff and, and that you're talking about in, in animals is, is similar to work uh, methods that have been developed in humans. And, and I, I think one of the things that's really cool about network science and network studies is there's a similar fluidity of you know, going from different systems to different systems to find out uh, where they're relevant. And people who are sort of experts in network science and network analysis have been able to jump around to different study systems and import the, the methods from place to place. Um, and I, and I, I, I mean, I focused on humans because I think that that's kind of, that's just sort of what I'm most interested in. But, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I am familiar with some of the animal stuff and I, like I said, I, I, I love reading and, and, and going to talks about uh, animal behavior, especially of these kinds of things. I mean, um, you know, and, uh, you know, Lucy Applin and Damien Farine and I wrote a paper a couple of years ago about exactly what you're talking about, using models to yeah. understand patterns in, in social transmission in, in animals. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there's certainly relevance. Thanks. So, Paul, um, what do you think about the methods and tools developed in physics? Uh, there's a field of social physics, and there are also statistical physics and network theory, which seems quite appropriate to apply to some of the things you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I tried to sort of get at that a little bit at the beginning, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the modeling frameworks and come that I'm interested in, you know, came out of social physics, um, like Ising models and uh, some of even the, the first sort of conformity models and opinion dynamics models came out of physics. Uh, and I, like I said, they're great. Um, I've read a ton of these models and learned a lot from these models, but I, I do think that there's a certain point at which you, you have to stop just playing around with assumptions for sort of as recreational mathematics and really try to get, you know, bore down deep into the details of human behavior and human existence. And I think that having, you know, sort of richer social, um, social science training or at least inclination for that is really valuable. So I, I, I definitely don't want to discount that at all. I, a lot of the best modeling frameworks and, and work in studying how these models work um, comes out of that, those kinds of communities. Um, I just saw a thing in the chat from Sage Gibbons. I had a pop filter and it broke. So I'm sorry for any pops or hisses. Um, so one of the other questions that, that sort of came up with, uh, was, um, uh, they had a problem with uh, sort of the definition of cultural ev evolution and and how does divine uh, de how it is defined exactly. Um, so the example he gave was a human invented a ball and and the ball was used to be played with and from it was created games and now we have Neyland Stadium at, at UT that seats 110,000 people. Um, is that cultural evolution? Uh, you know, there's a lot of details in there that are missing, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I guess I'm, I used to be much more interested in, in, in the particulars of the, like how exactly is cultural defined and how exactly is cultural evolution defined. And I, I guess I don't care as much anymore. Um, you know, I, I, we learn from each other. We build on things that, that come before us and culture is just the, the, the milieu in which we live. It's sort of, there is no culture that is separate from people and there is no people that are separate from culture. Um, I think culture is just what happens when people get together in a, in a prolonged, uh, you know, live together for long enough or exist together for long enough. Um, you know, and, and individuals learn 
uh, and change in their lifespan and cultures and the kinds of things that are available for thing, people to learn and to do change. And all of that, I think, is, is part of cultural evolution. So this is a little bit uh, more detailed question. Uh, Hamilton's rule plays, uh, pays, plays a core role in explaining cooperation in microbes. In human social evolution, many of the models developed were made by uh, Nowak which has a strong opinion against inclusive fitness. Why do you think Hamilton's role, inclusive fitness being so little used in the field of cultural evolution? Um, I don't actually think it is so little used in the field of cultural evolution. I think people like Martin Novak have a thing with it, but I, I mean, you know, those papers just don't make any sense to me. And to like, um, I've read, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and I, I, I think there's a few different things. I don't need to get into a debate about, um, you know, the definition of inclusive fitness and the use of it in models of cultural evolution. Um, although in, in certainly in the, in the, in the book version, I, I do derive a sort of general case of, of Hamilton's rule. Um, the, the issue, the thing about Hamilton's rule is that while, you know, sort of non-human animal biologists focus on uh, the role or its relationship to, to genetic relatedness, it's way more general than that. And really it's, it's about assortment. It's about non-random assortment among phenotypes. And I think once, once you realize that, then it's, ex it's extremely relevant um, to human behavior about how individuals who are necessarily cooperative and maybe got that cooperation from common cultural descent um, are more likely to interact than at random. And I th in those cases, then you can, you can take a Hamilton's role approach. Um, so a very nimbus question, um, since we're all about working interdisciplinary. Uh, one person asked, can't you just uh, work with a math whiz? I could add a uh, computer science whiz. And another person commented, so uh, what are your thoughts on working in teams and a subunit of how to put those teams together in these fields that touch on so many different areas? Yeah, I love this question. Um, so uh, I, I, I just published a paper which is uh, called uh, how, to, how to Translate a Verbal Theory into a Formal Model, um, which is maybe a little bit overly ambitiously titled, but uh, and I talk about that. Um, uh, exactly this question. Um, although I will say that a lot of my answer is going to be stolen from the biologist John Wilkins, so props to him. Um, I, I think on the one hand, absolutely, like I said, you know, specialization and uh, division of labor is sort of what human culture is all about and, and working to our strengths and figuring out how we could benefit from each other is definitely the way to go. Um, that said, you know, a modeler, like anybody, is not just a technician, right? They are, they are scientists, and they are looking to, to probe, you know, deep questions about reality, just like all of us are. And so, yes, absolutely. Get a modeler on your team. Get a person who does uh, phylogenetics. Get a person who does behavioral experiments. Work together and build up rich theories from all these different perspectives, 100%. But you also have to know what each other are doing, right? You still have to know what it means when the phylogeneticist comes in with their, you know, PCR analysis. You have to know, that's showing my own ignorance probably, but you have to know what, you know, the, why the different behavioral measures um, work the way they do and how they get at the questions. And you have to know if you're not the modeler, how the model works, what all the assumptions are, what all the parameters mean, how they work together, because otherwise you don't know, because otherwise it's just like, oh, I've got this idea here, modeler, go prove it with math. That's not the way it works, right? The model is doing work. It's not just proving what you already knew. It's showing you new things and you have to understand it well enough to see how, uh, you have to understand the model well enough to get information from it and see what the model is telling you. And then that's true of all specialties. So yes, 100% teams working together, but also everyone has to understand what each other are doing. Great. Um, are there any other comments or questions from the panelists? Uh, 
Okay. Um, you know, one of the questions in the Q and A that that got a lot of uh, response was about uh, questions about the in inexactness of social science, and some people point out there were some models available to to do that, but they're often difficult. Uh, do you have any comments related to uh, um, how hard it is to uh, apply good formal theory frameworks to social science? I mean, uh, yeah. C can you can you read off something? Uh, um, like the exact you... question was: Are social sciences inexact just by definition, or just because there is arguably no good formal theory framework available yet to put it to the same level of exact science? And then Patricio said there are uh, theoretical frameworks; they are just harder to map with empirical data because and and things like that. Uh, and measurement error, um, so. Yeah, I think I think Patricia is absolutely right. Um, so yeah, there's tons of formal theory in social science, although, you know, I'll say never enough, but um, I think what makes the social sciences inexact are not that there aren't models, it's that the kinds of questions we're often interested in, like inequality, cooperation, coordination, uh, information, opinions, beliefs, analogies, you know, these are things that are very hard. Identity, you know, these are things that are very difficult to pin down and say, I have a, an exact measure of this and it is clearly the measure and we should all use this measure and this measure perfectly captures this concept that we're interested in. That's extremely rare. It doesn't, it's not completely absent, right? There, there might be like wealth is, if that's what you're interested in, GDP, these are things that like, if you're really trying to predict GDP and all you care about is GDP and you care about it for in itself and not as a measure of economic prosperity or well-being or anything like that, then fine. But if you do care about those things, you care about prosperity and happiness and identity and inequality, then the measures you have are always flawed and we know this, right? And we know this is sort of a, a constant issue with social science and we sort of do the best we can and there's always sort of more nuance uh, to unpack and we have, there's this constant push and pull between saying, well, but wait, 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 there's more nuance and also say, but, but if we just, if we only care about nuance, then we're, we're never gonna get anywhere. So we have to operationalize it some way and just deal with that for a while. And I think that both of these points are correct. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to have any sort of formal theory that tells you exactly what's going to happen because the way the concepts we're interested in are, are very difficult to measure precisely in a way that everyone agrees on. Um, and I think that that's just fundamentally a limit. Um, but I still think you, you, get a, you, you still get pretty far. And actually, you know, models do work in... In, in this way too, right? Because what models can do is to say, well, when I'm talking about this thing like cooperation or inequality, I mean it like this. And I mean it like this relationship among people that do this or individuals that do this. And therefore, if, if we define it this way, then this will happen. And someone can say, well, but this other thing happens. And I say, well, that's not the way I've defined it. And you might say, well, then the way you've defined it is stupid because nobody does that. And then that's also a conversation to be had. And then we have to build a better model, right? But the model sort of lay out exactly all of this. So I, I quoted Jeremy Gunnar-Wardena, he has this great paper that I, I stole a line from, uh, which is, uh, I think it's called something like models, uh, a realistic view of our limited thinking or something like that. Uh, so I think we have one last question. Um, I have a question for Paul about complexity theory and computational social science as an alternative educational or methodological strategy to evolutionary theory and modeling to understand cultural evolution. Complexity theory focuses on nonlinear systems with emergent properties, uh, complex adaptive systems adapt at near chaos continuations. Um, are human societies such a phenomena? In other words, are most social process phenomena emergent? Uh, regardless, couldn't social phenomena emergent or otherwise be better understood 
through a reductionist study of individual motivational, especially if individual motivation for cooperation is the bedrock of human behavior. Well, those are, that's two different questions. Um, and I think that, uh, I mean, it, it may not be written as two different questions, but right. in my head, those are two different questions. So let, let me, let me tackle the first one, which is, yeah, I mean, complexity science is, it's awesome. I love it. And everyone should learn it. Right. Like, um, I, I don't think of evolutionary science and complexity science as separate, really. I think of them as if you're really going to understand evolution, you need to you need to learn some things from complexity science. And if you really want to apply complexity science to understanding behavior, you got to learn some things about evolution. Um, you know, all the stuff from complexity science, networks, attractors, emergence, um, dynamical systems, these are really important components of how to build formal frameworks and understanding of evolutionary systems and cultural systems. But you also need to know generally how these things change and evolve and, and what the, how the organisms and the, the cultural unit, uh, you need to know some details as well. You can't just be like, wow, complex systems are amazing. I can use them you know, to understand everything. Well, yeah, but you still need to know some things about the specific systems you're interested in. Otherwise, you're just saying, you're talking about general properties of general systems. Once you have to, once you have to narrow in on details, you got to learn some things about the, the real thing. Um, can you just learn about individual behavior? No, you can't. Um, I mean, this is, this is why uh, siloing is such a problem with it. Like you have people like in psychology and cognitive science who are only interested in, in what individuals are doing. And then you have people in, in social science departments that are only interested or mostly interested in how groups you know, and societies behave and they barely talk to each other. You know, individual behaviors come from somewhere, right? Individuals, you know, they're shaped by evolutionary or by genetic evolution, uh, which is a population process. They're affected by cultural evolution. Um, even developmental processes, which seem like individual processes, right? The things that people are exposed to, the affordances that people have, the, the, the languages that people learn, you know, are all shaped by cultural evolution, are all shaped by cultural processes. So you can't understand individual behavior without understanding the social landscape uh, and the sort of long-term trajectory of how that landscape came to be. And you can't understand the, the social landscape without understanding individuals' behaviors. So you, you, can't, under, you can't do either uh, and just one. You've got to do both. Well, I'm, I'm sorry we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, uh, but I am going to ask one personal question at the end here. Are you in a band? And when is your first album coming out? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in a band that, that got uh, sort of you know quasi shut down uh, due oh. to the pandemic. Uh, I, I was in a band uh, about 10 years ago called The Small Dinosaurs and our album is available on Spotify. Great, so Small Dinosaurs, Spotify, you know, uh, we really appreciate your talk and we look forward to uh, the next talks in the seminar series. Sergey, is there anything you wanna say? No, I just so sorry, Paul. I had to kind of to turn off myself. Yeah, it was a great talk. Thank you very much. And I hope to see everybody. Thanks. Okay. My pleasure. Next time we have any with me. And, yeah. and everybody that's registered will receive a reminder for next week's talk. Um, and maybe some of we, we can get some of these other people to answer some of the questions that weren't weren't answered today. Thank you again, Paul. And Here's where we'd be clapping and giving you all sorts of kudos. Um, so have a great day. Thanks a lot, Paul. Everyone. Thanks, everybody.